Oh, we are live on Facebook. All right, so let's do this. Let's jump right in. It's actually, it's 1.59, so right in the nick of time if things function on schedule during quarantine. I don't know. It seems like nothing goes the way you would expect it to in quarantine. Yeah, yeah. Um, but how are you, Bronwyn? I'm doing good. Yeah, I'm doing real good. It's a, kind of a gray day here in Nashville. Uh, so I'm just kind of hanging out and playing some fiddle this morning. Awesome. Yeah. Well, I, I want to thank you for being a part of this series, this interview series. Uh, Bronwyn is our second interviewee. Our first was Ross Holmes two weeks ago. And uh, I had this idea a few weeks ago, if, if you're unfamiliar with the series, um, just as a way to connect with more people during quarantine and, um, and uh, yeah, just really to connect to community. And also for me to ask some of my favorite musicians uh, some questions and for you to ask them some questions. So I'll just say that uh, this whole thing is public. It's, there's a passwordless Zoom meeting, which is in the Facebook event, which you're more than welcome to join. And uh, at the end, we'll take questions for Bronwyn. So Bronwyn, thank you for joining me. Yes, happy to be here. Sweet, well, I, I had to start with uh, the following, because this is just too much of a coincidence. So yesterday on Facebook, someone posted a photo of us from 2007, I believe. Yeah. Uh, a photo of us playing music with Duncan Wickle, uh, who's another great fiddle player, who's going to be on this series, as a matter wow. of fact. And uh, at that time when I met you, Bronwyn, uh, you were this amazing Irish fiddle player. And a, a few years went by, I think you had gone to Berkeley. And I remember we were both on the same tour in in France playing with the great Liz Knowles. And I hadn't seen you probably since that photo was taken. And you were this burning bluegrass player. Uh. <laughs> it, I, I did not know that that was going on behind the scenes. So um, I was wondering if you could just share with us just a little bit of your your background musically, your first musical beginnings, uh, specifically with the fiddle, and then maybe your transition into bluegrass. Yeah, totally. Yeah, it's definitely a kind of a, it's been quite a ride so far. I, um, I started playing fiddle uh, up in Vermont. I started when I was three, and um, I, apparently I saw some girls busking on the street when I was three and asked my, they were playing violin, and I asked my dad for fiddle lessons or violin lessons, and it kind of got me a Suzuki teacher um, who, who also taught me fiddle tunes on the side. And I guess I gravitated a lot more towards those. I think I was kind of a bad Suzuki student and I didn't really practice that material. Me too. Um, yeah. Uh, so I think when I was like maybe seven, I started, I think my parents asked me if I just wanted to take fiddle lessons. So they found a fiddle teacher who was a Cape Breton fiddler, um, Beth Pelford up there. And she sort of introduced me to that world um, just sort of by coincidence. And um, when I was 10, my family moved to Charlottesville, Virginia, and uh, there wasn't any Cape Breton music down there. We couldn't find any teachers. So I kind of got into the next closest thing, which was Irish music. Um, and when I was, I think I was 12 when I started going to the Swan and o Gathering, where I met you and Duncan and Jack Devereaux and a wow. bunch of other like. So before um, that photo? Yeah, I think, yeah, I think maybe 12 or 13 was my first year. Um, yeah, and man, playing with you guys that you know, those next couple of years when I was a teenager was probably one of the most inspiring things, like, that like kept me going and wanting to, wanting to do music. Wow. Yeah. And then like, you know, I remember Duncan started going to Berkeley a couple of years before me, because he's a little older. And then I would start to hear about Berkeley from him and he started improvising and playing bluegrass more. And mm. I think that kind of inspired the um, I just started hearing people do other stuff on the fiddle other than Irish music and it kind of I just liked the sound of it and um, so going to Berkeley I man I think I kind of had no idea what I wanted when I went to Berkeley I had these vague ideas that I was going to be like a Celtic fiddle player that played jazz I think was my first idea um, and then I got to Berkeley and there's this like raging bluegrass scene and and then I think I just sort of, I was like really intimidated for a while about like even trying to declare that I wanted to play bluegrass because it seemed like sort of impossible. Mm -hmm. It's just like a lot of the skills I didn't have, um, like being able to improvise or, or even sort of knowing my way around through chords and that kind of stuff. Um, but I sort of, I guess I just kind of 
kept flirting with the idea of playing bluegrass and eventually I wanted it enough that I just decided to dive in and com like commit to doing that. So when you got to Berkeley, you had only been playing, shall we say, Celtic music, Cape Breton, traditional Irish? Yeah, pretty much. Yeah. Like, even though I was, you know, I was hearing you guys play a little bluegrass when I was a teenager, I wasn't really doing that. And I was just kind of listening. I mean, one of the most amazing things about your story <laughs> so far is that um, you came out of this experience of Berkeley with this whole other, I mean, not everyone... I would hope that everyone watching has heard you play, but if you haven't, I mean, you just have such a, a definitively bluegrass language. It's just so like, you've clearly done the homework. You like speak this language fluently. And uh, I feel like that doesn't happen to everyone that goes to Berkeley because there are so many influences, so many different styles that could all kind of fuse together and create kind of a watered down version, shall we say. Uh, it doesn't happen to everyone, of course, and you're an example. so. Um, was there anything specific that you did to, to make this such a, I, I don't want to say a transition because I believe you still play Irish music, but basically to just become bilingual or trilingual in another musical genre? Yeah, I mean, yeah, yeah being at Berkeley definitely doesn't guarantee that you're going to get deep into any one kind of music because there's so many different kinds of music available to like study there. Um, but I think just the sound of traditional bluegrass really grabbed my ear and the, the people I was hanging out with were really deep into it you know there's a lot of still a lot of great um traditional bluegrass players up in Boston so I think just being around those people and they them calling songs that I didn't know and then I'd go and learn that song the next day and you know just kind of immersing myself you know the Cantab Lounge there's this place up in Cambridge on um, this this dive bar that had a bluegrass night for like years and years um so going there and getting to play with um people there and there's some older people there that had played with um kind of bluegrass legends they played with people like joe val and um so there's there's some really really deep bluegrass musicians in boston that i got to play with so just being a really active participant of that music community and just surrounding yourself with those musicians and and, and the music recordings i'm sure yeah. um were there certain for people that are getting into this music, maybe they already have an understanding of music, the fiddle, violin. Um, are there certain study techniques that you did, or perhaps still do, that you find work really well for you in terms of absorbing this music? Because I would imagine that it was different than learning Irish music. So what, uh, what did you do differently in studying bluegrass music? Yeah, man, totally. Um, what did I do differently? Well, I mean, I think a big difference between bluegrass and Irish music is um, is the vocal song element. You know, like to play bluegrass fiddle well, I guess you have to you have to be able to back up a singer well and, and play with a singer. And so that was that was kind of a thing I worked on a lot and still work on. And you know, just, I mean, but then there's a lot of things that's the same, like just learning the vocabulary, learning the repertoire. You know. Um, so is that transcription? Is that pure listening? Yeah, a lot of transcription. Yeah, okay. a, a lot of learning people's solos. A lot of like once I would learn a solo, and I still do this like constantly, is like dissect that solo and try mm. to, um, yeah, just like take out a, a lick and then see how many different places I could use that lick and how many different keys. Mm. So you can actually, actually use it in, um, in places other than the place you learned it. I knew you studied in, I believe you studied in Matt Glazer's, I'm going to butcher the name, but the, uh, the American Music Program, is that? Oh yeah, American Roots Music Program. American Roots Music Program. Yeah. Um, is there a specific pedagogy for bluegrass, for American styles? Man, I'm not sure. I mean, I know that people have different, you know, there's like the Mark O'Connor method, which I think, right. you know, would take people from the very beginning and, and but, um, but I'm not, yeah, I'm not sure, you know, I think they were, they just started the program when I joined, like when I joined, it was the first year. So I think they kind of refined the program as I went along and still have been continuing like to add more classes and more visiting artists. Um, but I don't, and I think there's not, not that I know. Of. Well, you do a lot of teaching. So, um, and I don't know if you're a method teacher or what, but uh, I would imagine you probably have some attitudes on teaching this music. Yeah, I mean, I definitely, 
Yeah, I've definitely, I've t- been teaching for like so long. I started teaching like definitely a lot, started teaching a lot while I was at Berkeley um, and I've been teaching ever okay. since. And uh, yeah, I don't know. I teach, I mean, I teach by ear. I kind of try to teach like how I would like to have been taught right. um, in terms of bluegrass with, you know, kind of giving people real life jamming skills right away. Like, mm. Um, that would work for their level you know whatever their level is there's still ways that you can show them how to participate in a bluegrass jam cool Um, got it let's talk about mile 12 a little bit so this is this is your bluegrass band which i would think um most people know you for if they're if they weren't already familiar with you mile 12 might be a way that they became familiar with you how did this band come about and tell us a little bit about um your projects right now with this band? Yeah, the band's about six years old. We all met up in Boston. Um, Two of us, only two of us are Berkeley graduates or alums, and that's a common misconception. Everyone calls us a Berkeley band, but (laughs) less than half of us actually went to Berkeley. Is is that a good thing or a bad thing, a Berkeley band? I don't know, I don't know. (laughs) Um, But uh, yeah, we have kind of, kind of we're all up in Boston for different reasons and and all met at that at that dive bar the can't have lounge on like the Tuesday nights we just kind of all end up going because that's where you go if you like bluegrass in Boston and Mm -hmm. you know I I think I was like maybe two years out of college at that point and sort of doing a lot of local gigs in New England but um I think I wanted like a vehicle to be able to tour nationally a little more and Mm. you know I think there's like a big history of of bands forming in Bo- like bluegrass and acoustic music bands forming in Boston. Like there's there's Crooked mm-hmm. Still, there's the Deadly Gentleman, there's right. Della May, there's um, Joy Kill Sorrow, mm-hmm. just for the more recent ones. And so it, it seems like kind of a doable thing because you've got all these friends who are slightly older than you, and you see them see them doing this and just make just deciding that they're going to be a band and and getting good and coming up with original material and and suddenly they're touring nationally. So. So by that, that point, you knew, I'm going to do bluegrass. This is my path. Yeah. I mean, for better or for worse, I think I kind of decided I was just going to, like, just go for it with bluegrass. Um, I was just more excited about it than Irish music at that point. Um, I knew. Sure. Yeah. So uh, the band, yeah, I mean, in the last six years, you've won a few IBMA Momentum Awards. You've released two albums. Is that correct? Mm-hmm. Yeah. Uh, yeah. This, yeah. Yeah, we released, um, yeah, we've done two full-length albums. We've done two EPs. We did an EP way at the beginning um, when we played about five gigs. So it's a little, mm-hmm. it's very fresh. Um, and we did a, we released an EP this year, actually, kind of just as a fun, um, like, sort of lower pressure project this winter. We had a bunch of free time, and it was kind of like a covers and collaborations EP. Mm-hmm. Um, but, yeah, and the IBMA has been really supportive. Um, it was really cool to win like the band momentum award and um, myself and David, our mandolin player, both like got the instrumentalist momentum award uh-huh. um, two years ago, which was su- super cool nod. You know, it's just, it's cool to, you know, you're putting yourself out there for a couple of years and to, to get recognition from like the bigger bluegrass community that, that they like what you do is like really encouraging. I was super excited by the way, when David joined the group, I just have to say that. Yeah, think, for sure. I think I had just been playing tunes with him that summer at the Swan and Noah Gathering. And then a few months later, he was in the band. I was like, Dude, that's awesome. Yeah. He's yeah, a great mandolin yeah, player. Us too. We, like, we tried to be a bluegrass band for about two years without a mandolin player as a four piece without a mandolin. And that's a very strange combo that I don't recommend. Um, I feel like right. we went about as far as we could and it's like, you kind of need a mandolin. You don't maybe need a fiddle. You don't, maybe you don't need a banjo. You know, there's manzanita, but you really need a mandolin. So. Mandolin, yeah. America's instrument. I mean, there's many. Um, well, cool. So let's talk about what the band is doing now. I mean, I know COVID is obviously like, it's kind of paralyzed our careers in some ways. I mean, paralyzed in the recoverable sense, right? We just kind of feel like, wow, where do we go? Because we don't know when touring's going to pick up again. Has Mile 12 been doing anything uh, specifically to deal with those challenges presented by COVID? Any specific kind of fan engagement or your own initiatives? Man, not really. I mean, it's been a little tough because we're all spread out. We've 
we've got um, only two members are still in Boston. I'm down in Nashville. Our bass player is in New York. And David, our mandolin player, has actually been in Northern Ireland this whole time because he married a mm -hmm. woman over there. And they're still working out their green card stuff, which got delayed because of COVID. Sure. So yeah. we haven't even gotten to do like live streams together. Um, I think we've all got, you know, the only thing we've really been able to do is some of those those videos where you, you know, everyone records their parts separately and you put it together and it's a, I can't remember what the acapella app like. Oh yeah, yeah. We did a few of those. Um, I think we're all just kind of waiting, you know, we'll post we'll right. stuff on, on social media, but it's mostly kind of throwback stuff because we aren't sure what the future is going to hold or when it's right. going to happen. So since you're not touring, have you been finding other projects, other, uh, uh, they can be musical or not? other things to do with your free time? Yeah, I mean, a lot of practicing, a lot of digging back into like old bluegrass stuff. I've been learning a lot of Chubby Wise and Bobby Hicks and um, Paul Warren. Fiddle Patch so, album? What's that? The Fiddle Patch album? Oh man, I haven't dug into that one so much. I was mostly doing bluegrass album band stuff. I remember you played like Bobby Hicks's version of Estralita to a T. So I was like, she's clearly yeah. studied that album. A little bit, man. I should I should get back into it, but yeah. So definitely, like getting to work on a bunch of stuff that I, you know, maybe I haven't had time for. Been doing a lot of like exercise, a lot of outdoor walks, it's a good a thing. Lot of gardening, fishing. I saw a few fishing, fishing posts on Instagram. Yep, a lot of fishing, yeah. So definitely exploring and teaching a lot of teaching. A lot of teaching, I've, yeah, a lot of teaching, and it's just been cool. Um, you know, a lot of it's nice to like see people every day and got my fiddle friends online that I talk to. So. Right, yeah, yeah. yeah uh, let's, let's talk a little bit about your single and subsequent solo album, your first solo album, correct? Yeah. Congratulations. Thank you. Yeah, man, that's been a, that's been a nice distraction and like a fun thing to, to work on. Um, I recorded it last, or this past winter, back in, I guess, January and February. And, um, and I, you know, I'd, I'd been planning to put it out at the beginning of the summer, but um, I just got a little delayed with everything that's been going on. But I decided to to put it out for a September 4th release date just to, because I, I don't know, I feel like it's kind of more exciting to put out music when it's still pretty fresh and you've recorded it recently. You're more excited about promoting it. Sure. People are probably more excited to hear it. Um, oh, by the yeah. way, I was very excited to hear it. It is oh, a killer okay. record. Broad, for those of you watching, Bronwyn very generously shared with me the master, and it is amazing. So definitely follow her on Spotify so you can, or wherever the record's going to be available. Oh yeah, Spotify, all the places. Yeah, it was fun. It was like, um, I wrote a couple original tunes for it. I had some special vocal guests. Like, I was so blown away that, like, Tim O'Brien agreed to sing a song, Sarah Jarose sang a song, Chris Eldridge, um, my friend James Key, and... Yeah, like um, Sarah, uh, Sierra Hull played it on a track and my friend Laura Orshaw. Yeah, it was just like a whole bunch of people that I really love and admire and it kind of came together in a fun way. And it's, it, I mean, it's amazing. Like, everyone's performances are just amazing. And it was produced by Wesley Corbett, right? Mm -hmm. Is, that, is yeah. that how you say it? Yeah, Wes, yeah, Wes Corbett. Yeah, Corbett. I mean, Wes has been yeah. such, a, such a great like musical influence and friend to me for a long time. Um, when I first moved down here to Nashville, um, he was kind enough to let me uh, rent a room from his house for like the first six months. We would like play banjo and fiddle tunes like pretty much every day. Um, so I think that was kind of one of the things that really inspired the record and inspired um, mm -hmm. me to want to like ask him to be the producer as well as play banjo on it because I just really value his musical taste. True. Um, and yeah. So is there any plans for I know we're in COVID and everything, but some sort of tour based on this record? You know what? I, I don't really think so right now. It's, yeah, I kind of, I think it's more, my intention with it was more to just have something out there online that kind of represented some things I'm excited about musically and something that I'd probably sell on the road with Ball 12. Right. Yeah. Yeah, I mean, well, that's, I mean, th there's no right reason to release record i think any reason is a right reason yeah is what i mean okay. to say so uh it's i mean it's an amazing record bronwyn it really is i'm mm -hmm. i've only listened to it once but i'm definitely gonna be listening to it a few more times and maybe stealing some licks from you just don't be surprised if we meet up in a few years and I've got some bronwyn well, licks on my, my sleeve stolen too, so. uh, i'm sure that's not entirely true um 
Well, let's uh, let's see. So it's two twenty. Maybe uh, we should just take a look at the Facebook event, see if there's any questions. Yeah. Uh, there's not good. pressure for people to ask questions. Yeah. Oh, Sherry Stone Weekman just liked my posts, okay. which is about you, Ryan. So yes. that's for the both of us. Um, yeah. I mean, if, if people don't have questions necessarily, and let me just say, um, people are welcome to ask questions in the the Zoom meeting as well. Um, if they don't have questions, that's <laughs> that's also completely fine. <laughs> but I wanted to make it as partic participatory as possible. Oh, and another th can, wait, I think we've got a question on Instagram. Um, okay. Old buddy from Berkeley, Stephen Franks asks, Bronwyn, how tall are you? Uh, the question that's been on everyone's mind. Very helpful. Um, I am five seven. Thank you, Stephen. Five seven. I I heard a great response to that question once. Is I'm about the height of um, two two normal sized twins. Oh, that's hilarious. <laughs> yeah. Uh, yeah, I we have, I haven't even got into your, you know, are you strawberry blonde? Are you oh, blonde? Yeah. I, you know, it's yeah. Really tough questions ahead. Yeah. Hard question. Um, another thing I did want to say, people can think of their questions. Oh, he's incredulous. Stephen can't believe it. Um, I wanted to just mention while people gather their thoughts about more questions that a new dimension of this series that I decided to integrate uh, right after the, the workshop with Ross, actually, Ross Holmes, is to, if the artist in the hot seat, which is you today, Brahman, if uh, the guest so chooses, we can integrate these interviews with, uh, or the, the interview with the person in question, we can in integrate that with some organization in the arts, more specifically music community, that is doing something great uh, in that community, be it education or being an independent music venue, providing a platform for musicians to play, uh, and who is also experiencing some challenges due to COVID. And I think that's kind of, it's getting more attention now. I think in the beginning, it wasn't getting as much, as much attention as to how much the, the music venues are suffering and, and how, fragile this whole ecosystem is because we depend on them for places to play, you know? Um, I mean, it's, I don't even like the word depend necessarily, but we work with them and we all work to make this, this, uh, this little world of folk music possible. So for this specific interview with Bronwyn, uh, maybe you can just tell folks a little bit about the organization we've decided on. Yeah, yeah, we um, we wanted to partner with this organization in Charlottesville, Virginia, um, where I'm from, called the Front Porch, um, which is a super cool music venue that also um, is is involved in music education and folk music education in particular, which makes it pretty unique. Um, mm -hmm. It's it's funny, you know what? I've I've heard so much about this venue, and I've it. Um, they started after I left Charlottesville, um, so right. I, okay. I haven't I haven't gotten to go back and actually. Um, play them, although I think there were some plans for my band to play there this year, which fell through due to what's going right, on. But, right. um, but yeah, I, I, you know, I hope we can wait, raise some awareness. And, you know, well, Beth, and the it. owner there, uh, excuse me, not Beth, Emily. Emily, who does an amazing job, actually. I know she has people that work for her, but you almost get the impression that she's like a one man, one woman show because mm -hmm. she does so many things. I mean, it's a music venue. It's a music school, so many things. So Emily was very excited uh, to be pairing with you, Bronwyn. Oh man, that's awesome. You, even though I know you guys don't know each other necessarily, but anyway, she was very excited that this can happen. So, yeah, totally. so for those that are interested to learn more about the Front Porch, uh, there's a link in the Facebook event. Uh, okay, we have a question from Greg Torales. Given, should I read it or should you read it? Oh, I can read it, I guess. Cool. Um, given that you've experienced both the Boston and Nashville bluegrass scenes, how would you compare and differentiate them from one another? Ah, um, gosh. Well, the Boston scene is much smaller than the Nashville bluegrass scene, as one would um, imagine. Man, I don't know. They're both super nice and super friendly. Um, I feel like I've, I'm just starting to get to know the Nashville bluegrass scene because I've only been here about a about a year and a half, and the ha half of this year has been I haven't really gotten to hang out with any scene. Um, but um, 
you know, at the Nashville scene, I mean, there's music that you can go to see every single night, pretty much in the in the country and bluegrass genres. So it's, uh, you know, it's, it's just a larger scene. And, and but there's a culture of picking parties in both. Yeah. And, um, yeah, I don't know. I'm still learning. Um, on that point, that just may, reminds me of another question. I mean, I when I really got into bluegrass in a big way was when I moved to New York City in 2014. Mm -hmm. And at that time, it was kind of like, in some ways, the golden age for bluegrass in that city. Mm -hmm. You had Sarah Jarose living there and Alex Hargraves and all the Punch Brothers. And I think Jake Jolliffe had just moved to town or moved to town shortly thereafter. Ryan Cavanaugh, um, not to mention a lot of people uh, who would be more known just within the New York community. Uh, Elio, Elio Schiavo and, mm -hmm. uh, and Rick, who run the Mona's Bluegrass Jam every Tuesday night or Monday night. Mm -hmm. But I guess the, the point was, it was so inspiring and actually kind of surprising to have such a thriving bluegrass scene in New York City. It's a big city, you'd expect it to have everything, but, um, but you know, that caliber of musicianship, I guess I expected that more in a place like Nashville, because that seems to be where everyone goes. And actually, a lot of those people have moved to Nashville since. Um, Brittany Haas was another one, uh, mm -hmm. although I, I'm not sure if she was actually ever living there. But she's somebody who lives in Nashville now. So um, how well do you know the New York scene? And maybe, maybe I'll put Greg's question to you about New York and Nashville. Oh, yeah, totally. Well, man, I feel like so many of the people that moved to the New York scene were in Boston for a certain point while I was like in the early part of when I was there, I moved in about, I was there starting in 2009. So it kind of seemed like at a certain point, Boston lost a lot of its bluegrass people to either New York or Nashville. Um, mm -hmm. And of course, new people have moved to Boston and the scene sure. is still thriving, but it's, you know, it's always different. Um, yeah, so I, I, I think I do know, I do know a lot of those people, but there's a lot of people in the New York bluegrass scene that, um, that I don't know as well. But I, you know, I've never been to that Mona's jam on Monday nights. Okay. Monday nights. Yeah. yeah. Um, uh, questions are rolling in here, Bronwyn. So oh, yeah. fortunately okay. we have, we have some behind the scenes support who is feeding us questions from Instagram. So the first one is, how about you read it like last time? Okay. All right. We've got a um, question for Instagram. Any desire to do a twin fiddle project and who would you want that second fiddler to be? Um, well, one of the tracks on my new album is actually a entirely twin fiddle track with um, the great Laura Orshaw, who is a Boston based bluegrass fiddler originally from Pennsylvania who plays with the Poe Ramblin boys and she's one of my fiddle heroes and good friends. I think she's I just think the world of her bluegrass fiddling. So she was who I asked to play on that track and we did this. Um, I worked up this twin fiddle arrangement to um, the, like the Bill Monroe and Vassar Clements tune Fiddler's Pastime, um, which I think I, I learned from the Kenny Baker recording. Kenny Baker yeah. plays Bill Monroe, and it's, I, I just never heard a twin fiddle um, version of it, so I thought that might be cool, so. Yeah, it's a great track, by the way. Another question here. Oh, how long has the album been in the making, and what were some highlights of the process for you? Oh yeah, um, I started conceiving of the album l last September. That was probably when I first, I mean, you know, I've been thinking about my first solo album since I was a kid, I guess. But, um, but I started seriously thinking about it last September and um, started working on the material then. The first tune I wrote, I started writing at IBMA last year. It's, for anyone who doesn't know what IBMA is, it's the International Bluegrass Music Association kind of yearly conference that happens in sort of a week of just bluegrass mania. Um, so I kind of started writing the first tune um, there. And highlights, man, um, maybe having, I mean, there were so many great players that played on the album. Tim O'Brien is just one of my biggest musical heroes, period. And I was just like over the moon that he agreed to, to um, sing a song. Actually, he, he sang lead on a song and he sang tenor on two other songs. So getting to, to be in the studio with him for a whole day was pretty, pretty incredible. I remember when we sat down, like, and I put my headphones on and, you know, he was in another booth and he was like starting to strum his mandolin and stuff. I just had this moment of like freak out for a second. Yeah. Like, I heard that sound, the man, Tim O'Brien's mandolin on so many albums. 
yeah and it was just like oh crap like we're gonna be on an album together now. yeah that's so cool did you know him well at that point i knew him a little bit you know we've um let's see he's been a mentor um at some educational things i've been a part of and uh, my band mile 12 we opened for him a couple times at the station in a few years back um okay. so yeah cool uh another very important question that's been on everyone's mind read it for us Bronwyn. oh what is your favorite fishing spot that is a good question I, it's well, actually it's actually fishing Spot. I don't know if you noticed that. Spot. Oh, yes, yes. Um, let's see. Man, I mean, I'm still learning about the fishing in Tennessee, but um, the Cumberland River seems to be a good spot that I've been enjoying recently. And um, some of the lakes around here, you know. Can I, not to interrupt, I, I have noticed this uh, ever since quarantine started. Everyone on Instagram is just posting fishing photo, fishing photos. <laughs> it's like a fever in yeah. Tennessee specifically. I think you have to be either a fishing person or like a, um, a sourdough bread person. It like seems to be one or the other, or maybe both. That is also a thing, the bread making. Yeah. That's a good point, yeah. Yeah. Uh, we have another question here from, uh, from Facebook this time. How, oh yeah, how does the creative process, um, piecing together a solo album different from your collaborative work in a band context with Mall 12? Yeah, that's a really great question. Um, well, it's a lot easier with Mile 12 in a sense because there's there's five people, you know, making decisions. Um, the creative process putting together the solo album was um, was me and Wes, and and he was so helpful. I, you know, I, I think I started getting a little overwhelmed with e even like choosing some of the material as well as arranging it, um, just because it's a lot of decision making just for one person. Mm -hmm. um, so he was sort of a lifesaver on that, and really kind of offered great feedback and, and ideas for, for both of those. Um, so it's just the two of yeah. us, really. I actually meant to ask you about that because in the liner notes, it says it's produced by Wes Corbett, mm -hmm. but you just said yourself that you had a lot of creative input. Um, so was Wes kind of, was he more of a sounding board for your ideas and guiding you? Or I guess how much creative license did you give Wes? Oh, yeah. Yeah, man, it was a kind of a bit of both. Like he was definitely a great sounding board um he you know we both came up with um like arrangement ideas i think i think i ch i chose all the material except for um i think he had the idea for the fiddle banjo tune we did um he mm. remembered this tune happy hollow it's like an old time tune so I oh yeah that was, that was one he picked so i think i picked the rest of it it's, but I didn't uh, ran it by it's from my it's from my part of the world i just spaced out on the fiddler's oh, yeah, name it's, um, i just want to know it yeah, marcus martin yeah Mm -hmm. Great tune. Yeah, totally. I'd actually never heard a bluegrass version of that tune. I've only ever heard the old time version. Yeah, it seems like it sort of got popular up in Boston. Like a lot of people were playing it up there for a while. So. Cool. Well, a good tune is a good tune in any style. Yeah, totally. um, that's that's interesting to hear. I've always I've always wanted to ask that question to people uh, when I can because the title producer could mean so many things. Yeah. You know. I think in, in some situations you just fork over the album and it's like, do what you will with it. The right. artist does that to the producer. It, it might be in their contract in some cases, but um, so yeah, that's why I thought I would ask because not everyone in the folk world necessarily works with a producer. Yeah, totally. Um, another thing that Wes, you know, helped contribute on was like my original tunes, like all four mm. of them, you know, I wanted to, you know, we, we shared writing credit on them because, you know, I would come in with, I would come in with like something that was close to it. And then he would kind of help mold it a little in different ways. Mm -hmm. He'd offer like, you know, it's just people like, Oh, that change that line there. Or like, let's change this mm -hmm. board. And um, so that was a pretty cool process. I learned a lot from him. How uh, on that point, have you written, have you like how, far back does your compositional history go? Have you been writing for a long time? I have, but on and off. Um, I, I, okay. mean, I wrote a fair amount at Berkeley, but um, I, I kind of wanted to start fresh, like writing a few tunes for this project because it just seemed like I'd probably grown a lot as a, like, a musician and hopefully as a writer since then. Um, but okay. I, yeah, I feel like I, I don't write that regularly. I kind of needed this project to give me a little inspiration. And w when you do write, this can be a question for current times or historically. Has it been in the bluegrass idiom? 
yeah it's been trying to be at least yeah and the like just kind of fiddle tunes and folky right folky melodies yeah well the tunes are great so i i wouldn't say you're trying to be i mean you've it is well thanks. It, yeah you you've gotten there so let me just check um i was going to check facebook one more time but now i'm spoiled because we have i should just mention uh who's behind the scenes here this is my wife Cristiani santos who is now an American citizen as of Monday. Oh man, so congrats. I just had to mention that. Um, but she's working behind the scenes, checking the Facebook and the Instagram, feeding us questions and letting people in. Um, so I have one less thing to be distracted by because I get distracted very easily. So anyway, I'll just acknowledge her uh, for helping us out with this. And someone said hi from Eugene, Oregon on Instagram. Oh, cool. And it just made me realize, um, it just reminded me of who our next guest is. So uh, we're not ending right now, we, as to say we don't have to, if there's more questions, um, but I'll just take this opportunity to say that the next interview in the series is gonna be with an Oregon fiddler, uh, who is a friend of both Bronwyn and myself, Alex Hargraves. And that's two weeks from today. I don't know what the date is, but uh, anyway, I'll be posting that up in my, my Facebook. And uh, obviously all of the interviews you can watch on YouTube afterward. Uh, so another thing I hadn't realized, but since the video will live on YouTube after this, people continue, they can continue to ask questions to you, Bronwyn, technically ah. through YouTube. So You're welcome to. maybe, uh, I don't know how we'll do this. Maybe this is an incentive for people to tune in on on a regular basis because maybe in Alex's interview, I'll answer some of the questions for you on YouTube. Yeah, go for it, go for you, it. I'll send them to you ahead of time. And, oh, okay, or you can just make up answers. Well, I could do that, yeah. <laughs> uh, one, one more question here from Kenneth Stewart. Ah, yes, um, do you consider style in your writing or do you let the process flow? Yeah, I definitely consider consider the style. Yeah, you know, I think, I don't know what my process has been so far when I'm trying to write a tune is, uh, you know, I'll have an idea of what kind of tune I want to write. Maybe I'll, I'll probably go so far as to pick a key, a vibe. Maybe I'll have a tune that I'm, ba that I like already that I'm basing it off of, um, of someone else's. Um, and then I try to let it flow from there. I feel like the more parameters I give myself creatively, the more, um, the more luck I have. And if I get too vague, um, I, I just get overwhelmed and nothing happens. Well, Actually, I want to comment on that because I think this is something that a lot of composers within folk traditions, we'll call them, uh, which is kind of an ambiguous term at times, but I think it's an issue a lot of us deal with because you, you, you said it yourself, I know you said it in a joking sense, but you try to write stuff in the bluegrass idiom. I think you do, but you know, there's still that question of like, where are the barriers, the genre barriers? Mm -hmm. And you know, uh, I think Obviously there's the purists in any genre and I have very liberal ears when it comes to music. So I'm much more, you know, I think like what the Punch Brothers are doing are great, although many wouldn't call it bluegrass necessarily. So maybe comment a little bit about, um, I, I don't know if this was Kenneth's point, but are you mindful of the genre in a way? It's like, well, I'm not gonna write an A part in G and a B part in E flat, or maybe you do. I know. Are there certain decisions like that that you make based on the bluegrass genre? Yeah, probably, totally. Um, yeah, and I feel like I like so many different styles within bluegrass. You know, I like the really traditional stuff, and I like, I like, I, I really love, you know, tunes like from Bale, some of the Bale Flex albums. You know, I think some of that is some of the best instrumental bluegrass out there, and stuff the Punch Brothers do. And I kind of. I wouldn't mind if my music, some of it fits in all of those um, worlds. So, you know, I think I, I'm not too worried about, I, I, th I think based on what I listen to and what I like and what I practice, if I'm trying, if I'm vaguely attempting to write in the bluegrass style, it's going to come out and it's not going to sound totally bizarre because I'll, I wouldn't, you know, I'll know if it sounds weird and it probably wouldn't, wouldn't right. be a project. Right. That makes any sense. It makes absolute sense. I think uh, good fiddlers in any genre quickly can convince us of their street cred mm. or, you know, of 
you know, like you listen to a fiddler and you kind of know after like the first few seconds or minutes, if this person has it, if they speak the language fluently and, and if they do, you give them much more, uh, what's the term creative license, free license to be adventurous. Like mm -hmm. I'm much more likely to listen to Bela Fleck play those crazy 10 part bluegrass tunes in B, E flat, A flat. Because I, because I can also hear the roots of his music and what yeah, he does. Yeah, yeah, totally. I think that's, yeah, I think that's what I was trying to, trying to get at. But like, if you, I don't know, if you, if you play this music enough and if you have that vocabulary in your fingers, then it's just going to end up coming out in different ways. And, and, you know, other people that like the kind of music are going to hear sure. that. Uh, one more question from me. Any plans for an Irish album one of these days, Bronwyn? Uh, yeah, not that I know of. Um, man, it's kind of, it's kind of pretty, that stuff is pretty far back there in my, in my brain. It, you know, it's, it's hard to keep it all, um, you know, I, I feel like there's only so much time I have and only so much room in my head. Right. Um, I, I don't think I could do an Irish album justice right now. It's a completely unfair question because you literally haven't even released this album yet. <laughs> and we're in the middle I, of a pandemic, so. I know. I've I, like I always kind of thought about that though, like how you know if that would be really cool to do someday. Um, you never know. Well, whatever you do, Bronwyn, I will listen, and I think everyone tuned in here will listen too. So I know it'll be great. Uh, well, this has been a real pleasure, Bronwyn. Thank you for spending your time with us to share some of your thoughts on music and life, and uh, you know, and agreeing to partner this with the Front Porch in Charlottesville. Um, so for those of you. Uh, obviously, if you can give, you you know, please do. But more than anything, we would love for you to just go to their website and familiarize yourself with what they do and their mission. Um, they're kind of the ideal organization for uh, who I'd like to see a part of this musicians' workbench series. So, yeah. uh, Bronwyn, this was this was a real pleasure. Thank you very much, and oh, good luck with me. the album. Hope it Thank you. tops all the charts in every Aww. genre. Thanks, Ben. Good talking yeah. to you. All right, everyone. We're going right. to uh, we're gonna sign off. Bronwyn, don't leave just yet. Okay. Um, but I'm going to stop the live here. So. Okay, I'll stop it on it. We'll see you in two weeks, everyone. Bye. Thank you. Cheers. Guys. Bye.